Reserves, gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me congratulate Mr. Smith, incidentally, on his recent elevation to become the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. We look forward to a productive session during the next couple of years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a blog post by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities summarizing the fact check that have repeatedly debunked the false claim that we just heard a few seconds ago that the IRS is going to hire 87,000 new agents immediately and a factcheck.org article confirming that not all of the 87,000 people that will be hired are going to work on enforcement. With Without that, objection. A very uh, distinguished member of the Ways and Means Committee is the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, and I yield him one minute. Gentleman from Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise to associate myself with the remarks of the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, I think uh, he used the right words when he talked about theater. And isn't it long overdue that we're honest with the American people about what this is about? Come on. You can't really believe that this, what you're proposing here isn't shielding the wealthiest people in this nation and corporations. People that Augie and Ray's in East Hartford are not fooled by this. And they understand what the agenda is. You place us further in debt and leave us with little else to do to help the people who need it the most. And what is this a guise for? Cutting what you call entitlements. What people in Augie and Ray's know are earned benefits that they pay for every single week out of their paycheck Gentlemen, gentlemen's where they time, pay their taxes. Gentlemen's time well. has expired. Gentlemen's time back. has expired. And a reminder to direct your comments to the speaker. Gentlemen reserves. Gentlemen. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to address the body and uh, seek to revise and extend my remarks. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, prescient in his description of Congress, especially as Congress addresses issues, most specifically the debt ceiling. Here's what Ronald Reagan had to say about Congress. It says, Congress consistently brings government to the edge of default before facing its responsibility. This brinkmanship threatens the holders of government bonds and those who rely on Social Security and veterans' benefits. And let me repeat that. Those who rely on Social Security, you could add Medicare, and veterans' benefits. That's what's at stake here. Reagan went on to say interest rates would skyrocket, instability would occur in the financial markets, and the federal deficit would soar. Why then would our colleagues on the other side of the aisle hold the American economy hostage? Well, in their own words, so they can cut Social Security and Medicare. They call these programs entitlements. Let us be clear, and for all of those listening to this, make sure you call your member of Congress and let them know that Social Security is not an entitlement. It is an earned benefit, something that people pay for weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And how do they know? How do we trust and verify this? All you have to do is go to your pay stub. It says FICA. That stands for Federal Insurance Contribution. That's Federal Insurance Contribution. Whose? Yours. The more than 66 million Americans who contribute to this program. It's an earned benefit. It is not an entitlement. 
they clearly are entitled to their Social Security. But here we have the roost of the year. We're going to hold the American economy hostage so that we can make cuts to a program that Congress hasn't enhanced in more than 52 years. On our watch, ours being every member of Congress, we cannot let this persist. Fortunately, because of hard work in the past, seniors are receiving a COLA this year because of COVID. But it's not been reformed, it's not permanent, and there hasn't been a benefit enhancement in 52 years. In 1971, a loaf of bread cost 72 cents. I don't have to go through the litany of what call costs have risen. And with 10,000 baby boomers a day becoming eligible for Social Security, this is not the time to cut the program. This is a time to enhance the program so that all of our seniors, especially those who were hit hardest by the pandemic, how do we know this? Of the more than a million people who have passed away from the pandemic, over 750,000 are over the age of 65. And who's impacted most by inflation? Those people who are on fixed income. And by definition, those on Social Security are on a fixed income and need our help the most during this time of inflation. It impacts every single district in this country. On average, there are 147,000 Social Security recipients in every congressional district. And to deny them the enhancements that they need during this inflationary time and during a time period when Congress has not enhanced the program in more than 52 years is long overdue. I yield back. Connecticut, Mr. Larson, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And first and foremost, let me uh, thank uh, all the panelists, first and foremost, for your professionalism. Uh, uh, having served on this committee for a while, it uh, gives me great pride to say how circumspect you are, uh, especially in putting forward uh, the facts uh, because of your nonpartisanship and even resisting opportunities when they present themselves, but always being uh, professional. That's a credit uh, to the congressional process as well. Uh, Martin Luther King co coined the phrase, the, the fierce urgency of now. And again, let me applaud the chairman because that's what's so important about this meeting and that's what's so important about getting the facts. And here are the facts. The facts are we're in the worst global pandemic uh, that we've witnessed uh, since the world's creation. We also find ourselves in a situation where we're dealing with inflation. And that fierce urgency of now impacts people over the age of 65 more so than any other group. Of the 1.1 million who have perished in this country because of this pandemic, over 834,000 are over the age of 65. And people over the age of 65 are the ones who tend to be on fixed incomes. And people on fixed incomes are the ones that are most ravaged by inflation. And the congressional negligence that's taken place is there have been nothing done to enhance the benefits of the nation's number one anti-poverty program, Social Security. Anti-poverty program for the elderly of, without Social Security, 40%, more than 40% of our current elderly population would be living below the poverty level. And yet Congress still does not act or vote. Social Security, as the chairman knows and people on this committee also, is the number one anti-poverty program for children. And especially in lieu of the child tax credit and its need to come back and be put in effect, but child care, spousal care, and more veterans rely on Social Security disability. 
More than 350 separate groups have come out, and we intend, and John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, back in 1963, designated the month of May as the month that we should pay attention to our elders. It was later, he didn't, wasn't around long enough to see that uh, transpire, but President Johnson put that into effect. It's important for a number of reasons that we put this information out there. We do have legislation on our side to put out there, and it should endure the test of public hearings and like all ideas, should be debated side by each. We're waiting to see the legislation from the other side. And what is so encouraging about this is the desire of both the chairman and the chairman of the subcommittee to get to a solution. I dare say that the solution is something that is going to require just not protecting Social Security, but enhancing it. 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible. That over the course of a year is uh, 365, 3,650,000 new Social Security recipients. Thing, a lot has changed since 1971. A lot has changed even since 1983. But what hasn't changed is Congress's inability to take action. This is not anything the President of the United States can do through executive order or that the Supreme Court is going to act on. It's going to take Congress and this committee to do what it's elected by its constituents to do, and that is vote. I commend the chairman for starting and saying we need facts, and part of those facts is the human infrastructure, the very beneficiaries that we need to hear from and what they're going through and what they're enduring. They are your mother and father, your brothers and sisters. They are your churchgoers. They are your neighbors. This is what we're talking about. This is America's number one insurance plan. This is the number one committee to deal with it. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. Schweikert, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I rise today to address the body on what has become a new term of art in politics called a polycrisis. Polycrisis is uh, when extraordinary events are taking place around the world, of which we are all too familiar with, including a global pandemic that has set off global supply chain issues, that has set off global inflation that impacts everybody around the globe all of which have been compounded by the Ukraine war and all the disruption that that has caused. So in the midst of this polycrisis, who has been impacted the most in this country by both the pandemic and inflation? People impacted most by the pandemic are people over the age of 65, of roughly the more than 1.2 million Americans who have succumbed to the pandemic, over 850,000, Madam Speaker, are over the age of 65. The people who are most impacted by inflation are people on fixed income, and they tend to be people over the age of 65 because they are the people on Social Security, which means that some 66-plus million Americans are infected by both the pandemic and inflation. And Congress needs to act. What we need to do most of all is put the debt ceiling issue behind us.
to play chicken with people's lives, with social security checks on the line, to default on the American dollar is criminal. These are probably unintended by the other side of the aisle, but nonetheless, the direct result of a gamble that makes no sense. And who's looking in during this poly crisis? But our competitors around the world, most notably China and Russia, who would love to see the value of the dollar and the standing of the United States shaken. Oddly and ironically enough, not happening by any of these events abroad, but happening right here in this chamber by the failure of Congress to lift the debt ceiling, something that was done three times during the Trump administration. And yet in the face of this pending crisis, with our seniors, the most vulnerable amongst us, facing excruciating circumstances, we continue to dither here put the debt ceiling on the floor, vote it, and lift it so that we can get on with sending relief to American people. Congress should be embarrassed by its negligence. It's been more than 52 years since Congress has enhanced benefits for Social Security. How can people go home and look their friends, their neighbors, their parents, their brothers and sisters in the eye and tell them that we've done nothing for 52 years. Do you think that things have changed since 1971, that prices might have gone up? Certainly they have. It's long overdue for Congress, not simply to protect Social Security, but to enhance it. So during this poly crisis, during this epidemic, during this time of inflation, the most vulnerable amongst us Social Security is the number one anti-poverty program for the elderly. It's also the number one anti-poverty program for children. It also happens to be the best economic development program for every single congressional district. An average of 145,000 people per congressional district depend on Social Security and receive those checks. And where do they spend that money? right back in the district. The time to act is now. I yield back my time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Larson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to talk about the poly crisis, the new term of art that people are using to describe what has happened globally in terms of a global pandemic, followed by global supply chain issues, followed by global inflation and underscored by the war in Ukraine. That has created incredible havoc here in this country. And of course, the group that is impacted the most are people over the age of 65. Here in the United States, with slightly over a million people who have succumbed to the pandemic, 850,000 plus have been over the age of 65. The same group, Mr. Speaker, is impacted by inflation. Inflation hurts people on fixed income the most. That are pe those are people on Social Security, who are Social Security recipients. And here in this chamber, we play games. We're in the midst of signing a discharge petition to make sure that we lift the debt limit. Mr. Speaker, we did that three times under the Trump administration without angst or fanfare. And yet here, for the group that is most impacted by this poly crisis, this global crisis, this is as though we're China and Russia are looking on and cheering this side of the aisle for their efforts to default on the full faith and credit of the United States government. And who will that hurt the most again? 
That will hurt people over the age of 65 and people that are on Social Security and Medicare and veterans who won't be able to get their checks. And why? To make a political point? This is the United States of America. We need to stand up and do the right thing for the American people, and that starts with taking care of our own. It's been more than 52 years since Congress has enhanced Social Security. And this pandemic and this ensuing inflation have hurt this group the most. There are more than 5 million of our fellow Americans who get below poverty level checks from their government for Social Security, something they paid into all of their lives. And contrary to the belief on the other side, this is not an entitlement. This is an earned benefit. This is what people have paid for. 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security, and Congress twiddles and diddles here. We need to pass an enhanced Social Security bill now. As Martin Luther King said, it's the fierce urgency of now. These people need this relief today. This is not the time for political gamemanship. Now is the time to act. I implore my colleagues on the, old, on the other side, don't be frozen in the ice of your own indifference towards the people of this nation who need this help and relief and need it now. Let's come together as a body and do what President Reagan did and do what President Eisenhower did and do what President Nixon did and come together and enhance Social Security on behalf of the citizens of this country. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The chair recognizes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise today to uh, address uh, the chamber for five minutes and talk about uh, what political scientists are calling a poly crisis. A poly crisis is um, a multiple events that have happened globally that have an enormous impact not only on the world but here. I'm going to focus on just three of them right now. The pandemic that we're currently going through, Mr. Speaker, which has been extraordinary, as well as the supply chain issues that have happened, a global pandemic creating global supply chain issues, which led to ensuing global inflation. And in the midst of that, the Ukraine war, which has become a global war, again, impacting supply chain and other issues. Who in the United States of America has this impacted the most? In our country, this pandemic has impacted the elderly. Of the 1.2 million people who have passed away, over 850,000 are over the age of 65. With regard to inflation, the group that is hurt most by inflation are people on fixed incomes. And that would be the close to 70 million Social Security recipients here in this nation. We have a crisis in this country, a pension crisis, and a crisis that Congress has neglected for more than 52 years. 1971 was the last time that Congress did anything to enhance Social Security benefits. A gallon of milk was 72 cents at that time. A lot has changed since 1971, but what hasn't changed is Congress's recalcitrance to address the needs of our seniors. Social Security is the number one anti-poverty program for seniors and the number one anti-poverty program for children. And yet, 
there are five million Americans currently who get below poverty level checks from the federal government having paid all of their lives into a system. And the only reason that's so is because Congress has enacted. It's long overdue for Congress to act. We have legislation that we'll be introducing in the Ways and Means Committee that will enhance Social Security, across the board increases for everyone, lift people out of poverty, provide every single district with economic recovery. Why? Because on average, there's 145,000 people per congressional district who are on Social Security. And that money is spent right back in that congressional district. People are not buying back stock options with their Social Security checks. They're spending it at the grocery store. They're spending it on rent. They're spending it on prescription drugs. That's what's needed. It's long overdue for Congress to act. It's not simply a question of protecting or saving Social Security. It's doing something to end this crisis in the midst of the worst pandemic, in the midst of inflation, in the midst of a supply chain issue to make sure that our elderly and our people are being protected. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back my time. Uh, I also rise uh, today, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to talk about the 88th <clears throat> birthday of Social Security. That will take place on August the 14th, and we're calling upon members all across this nation, joined by great groups like uh, the National Committee to Preserve and Protect Social Security, Social Security Works, the AFL-CIO, and the list goes on. But please save the date as a day to action. A day to action because Congress hasn't taken any action. In fact, it might interest people in the gallery to know that uh, Congress hasn't done anything to enhance Social Security in more than 52 years. And here we find ourselves in the midst of a pandemic, a pandemic that in this country has impacted people over the age of 65 more severely than any other group. Slightly over a million people have perished. Over 856,000 are over the age of 65. Those same individuals are the ones that, because of global inflation, have found themselves in a situation, as people on fixed incomes often do, that they are the ones that are most severely hurt. And so, as Reverend King would say, the fierce urgency of now is upon the United States Congress. And what are we asking the United States Congress to do? Vote. How hard is that? Uh, whether it's in the United States Senate or whether it's in the House of Representatives, Everybody claims how much they respect and love and admire Social Security. If that's true, then why don't we vote on it? It hasn't been enhanced in 52 years. The last time something was done in 1983, Ronald Reagan was president. Bob Dole ran the United States Senate and Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House. And they extended Social Security at that time its solvency, but they didn't do anything to enhance the program. I dare say that things have changed a lot since Richard Nixon was president in terms of the cost of procuring goods and services in this country, and yet we have not done anything as a Congress to enhance the benefit of the more than 66 million people who are on Social Security. That number will exceed 70 million within a year and a half. 70 million of our fellow Americans, and here's the real deal, five million of them get below poverty level checks from their government, having worked all their lives, paid into a system to get an earned benefit and find themselves getting a below poverty level check because the United States Congress has not acted on their behalf. 23 million fellow Americans get taxed on their work 
in their job for what they're doing. And they shouldn't be. That tax should be eliminated. There needs to be an across-the-board increase for all Social Security uh, recipients. That's why we call attention to this day of action. The day of action that's needed most, though, is by the United States Congress and for us to act bipartisanly across the board and make sure that, that people are getting the benefits that they've richly earned. 10,000 baby boomers a day become eligible for Social Security and still Congress does not act. America, rise up. Prevail upon your members of Congress to act. And by act, I mean vote. Vote to bring Social Security 2100 to the floor for a vote. Vote in the Senate to bring those bills to forward. If you've got a better idea, if you've got a better plan, lay it out there for the public to see. But for God's sake, vote on it for the sake of the American people. The American people deserve more from their Congress than lip service. They need action. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from Connecticut. Connecticut, yes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I thank all the panelists. Uh, this has uh, uh, been a, a very um, interesting uh, session. We don't often spend as much time on the Constitution uh, as we have today. And I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, the constitutionality of all this. I actually thought we were in a committee hearing in the United States Congress actually discussing in the Committee of Cognizance tax policy and discussing the ramifications of that policy. So rather than working around, I kind of feel like this is working directly. And the way that our system works, four witnesses come with very uh, important and well-established, well-researched views on their feelings and one is a counterbalance to all of that. For those that are listening in on this, that's how the system works. That's how it's supposed to work. So, Mr. Barnes, I had to ask you especially, uh, you seem to have a difference of opinion about Pillar Tool. Number one, do you think that the Constitution is being violated here uh, by the Biden administration or here in Congress? Well, because any tax legislation to enact Pillar 2 will necessarily be started in the House Ways and Means, will go to the Senate, will be signed by the President. It will follow our ordinary course of, of constitutional progress for tax legislation at the end of the day. And that was my impression, and that used to be a, a history teacher in school, so I thought that we were following the Constitution. You can have constitutional concerns, but we are following the Constitution. Also, there is big disagreement over whether or not the future for this great nation of ours in these joint agreements with more than 50 countries that are participating in this, it seems as though we should be going it alone as opposed to working with other nations in a global economy and in these times where we're in a world that needs to, where we need to be at the table seated there. And it seems as though we're saying, no, what we need to do is operate alone and by ourselves. That to me sounds an awful lot like isolationism. How are we advantaged by working together? with these other nations, Mr. Barnes? Let me, let me take two examples from tax history uh, that are not directly pillar two. First would be the treatment of corporate bribes. Uh, some of you are familiar with the history. In the 1970s, the U.S. said corporate bribes are bad. They should not be tax deductible. Other countries were, that's an ordinary course, the cost of doing business. It took 20 years before some of our major trading partners said bribes are not a good thing we should make them non-tax deductible and illegal. It, the U.S. leadership took decades, but we got the right result. Same thing with bank secrecy. 
Uh, a tax system can only be enforced if there's adequate information. There were countries that said bank secrecy is part of our blood. Uh, you shouldn't uh, come in and, and breach my tax bank secrecy. The U.S., with the help of Germany and a few other countries, over a period of time led to uh, sufficient information exchange to enforce our, our laws. Uh, I think U.S. leadership consistently has helped improve global tax rules, and I am confident uh, they did on Monday of this week, uh, and the continued participation by the U.S. will make the ultimate Pillar 2 rules uh, much, much better. And how will that advantage the United States long run in terms of the, our economy? Uh, I hope it will help us. Um, I realize that there are debates over whether Pillar 2 ought to exist at all or, or not, but there are some distinct advantages. I mentioned one uh, with the Singapore example to level the playing field. Um, it will put pressure on countries to reduce their corporate tax rates. Those, uh, those people who believe that high corporate tax rates, that is way above 15 uh, percent, are, are a deterrent to investment should cheer Pillar 2. With a country-by-country country analysis, a country like India, Japan, with high corporate taxes, will be starkly illustrated as having a rate where the taxpayers bear an excess cost. Today, with the blended rules under guilty, that pressure doesn't fall entirely on the high-tax jurisdictions because taxpayers can self-help to a lower rate. Uh, the other advantage for the U.S. is one Michael Plowgen mentioned, which is uh, it will reduce the incentives for U.S. businesses to move offshore. That has an advantage for investment in the U.S., U.S. workers, U.S. jobs. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Gentlemen, gentlemen from Connecticut, Mr. Larson is recognized for well, five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Plowgen, thank you. And I hope you get to speak now. Uh, uh, <laughs> we've heard a lot of uh, speeches. Uh, I didn't think we were going back to isolationism, but apparently that's the new road that we're setting out on is that we're going to stand isolated and alone. Also, just for the record, you know, about the Democratic majorities, they have this body called the Senate. And they have something called the cloture vote. I'm sure all of you are aware of that, where it takes 60 votes. Where in the Constitution does it say you need 60 votes to pass a bill? But Mitch McConnell swears by that, that that's exactly what is needed for things to happen and transpire. The House of Representatives should wake up more than 500 of our bills, Democrat and Republican and nonpartisan, don't get taken up in the United States Senate. I wish the press would write about that because of the cloture vote. So let's have that for the record. Now, Mr. Plowgen, uh, apparently in the, iso the age of isolationism, uh, Apparently, the United States exists alone in a global economy. And these other 50 countries, as been articulated by Mr. Thompson and was also articulated by Mr. Doggett, are they simply going to, if nothing happens, if the United States doesn't approve this, does this just simply, pillar two, just simply go away? No, Congressman, that, that's not what would happen. Uh, there are uh, jurisdictions that have already implemented uh, Pillar 2, uh, South Korea and Japan being two of those, and all EU member South states. South Korea and Japan, are they pretty active economies? They, they are. Oh, all right. And so South Korea and, and Japan, what, el what other economic impacts would that mean? Well, uh, the, the. Because all... we want to be isolationists, right? Right. right. All EU member states uh, are also obligated to implement Pillar 2, and, and most have uh, legislation at this point. Uh, and there are many of our other major trading partners, uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, that are move, moving forward. UK, as well. Canada, Australia. Boy, those sound like awful partners for us. So do you, you really, do, you know, don't you think we ought to isolate from them and... No? I, I don't think so, uh, Congressman. I think we, we need to be at the, the negotiating table um, in order to represent U.S. interests uh, in these discussions. Uh, and uh, as, as you know, the, the administration has proposed uh, reforms to, to implement Pillar 2 in the United States as well. And you kept on talking about a level playing field and allowing the U.S. to compete. 
How is that to our advantage, especially given this great nation of ours and our ability, as is demonstrated in the global economy, to compete? Absolutely. So uh, up to now, uh, U.S. multinationals have been the only uh, multinationals that are subject to a minimum tax on their foreign earnings. Uh, now, under Pillar 2, all multinationals, wherever they're headquartered, wherever so they operate. So previously, it was subject. only U.S. internationals, and now everyone is subject to that. Hmm, that seems like it's leveling the playing field to me. It does, and we believe that U.S. businesses will be able to compete uh, and win in that environment. It also levels the playing field for uh, small businesses and purely domestic firms uh, who cannot shift their profits offshore to avoid paying tax, um, and so they can and, compete and better. And why is that important? That's important because uh, they uh, also need to be able to compete and grow our economy. Small businesses are major employers uh, in the U.S., and that, that benefits American workers. So it's the small businessman that really is going to be advantaged as much as the large multinational is going to be advantaged through competition as well because it'll be the first time that the other global multinationals will be subject to the same tax. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's why the administration is pursuing this policy for Absolutely. business in general to level the playing field and allow the United States to compete and succeed and to grow jobs and grow this economy. That's exactly right. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> I rise this morning uh, to uh, welcome everyone back to Congress, where hopefully we'll get something done. An ominous note sent by the Speaker earlier in a press co uh, conference that there will be an impeachment proceeding, an inquiry. I don't think that's what the American people are ready for back home. They also said that they're here to shut down government. We need to shut down government. What the American people need is what everyone gave speeches about yesterday, talking about how after September the 11th, we all came together as a country and focused on what needs to be done. I have a great suggestion for you. How about we fix Social Security for the Americans that need it? We talked to the veterans, we talked to all the individuals who were first responders and tell them how much we appreciate what they do, but then we never vote that way in Congress. It's been 52 years since Congress has done anything to enhance Social Security. 52 years and no action. How about we do something unique in this body and get a vote on Social Security? Every member has a Social Security card, and you know exactly how many of your constituents receive a Social Security check, something that is an earned benefit, something that they have paid for and worked all their lives. Yet we're content here in this body to let five million fellow Americans in all of your districts, five million American Amer Americans get a below poverty level check from the federal government, when what they need is subsistence to survive. How about we get together as a body and come together and enhance the greatest insurance program in the nation's history, the number one anti-poverty program for the elderly, the number one anti-poverty for children. 10,000 baby boomers a day. And if you're out there, baby boomers, call your members. Ask them to take a vote on Social Security. Look at your pay stub. It says FICA, Federal Insurance Contribution. Who's yours? And this Congress hasn't done anything for 52 years. It's long overdue. And think of this as an economic development. If you think this is socialism, think about all the constituents in your district that are going to get a paycheck. Think about the economic activity. And where do they spend that money? right back in your district. They need your help. The nation needs your help. We need to come together and unite and enhance Social Security. Not just protect it, not cut it, as some have suggested, but to actually protect and expand the nation's number one 
number one program that helps the elderly and helps our children of this great country of ours. With that, Madam Speaker, I yield back my time. Mr. Larson is recognized to strike the last word. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your very thoughtful comments at the uh, outset of this, uh, and I want to applaud my colleague, Mr. Thompson, for his uh, legislation and the spirit in which this is being taken up, uh, because I think that's vitally important to this committee. Uh, Mr. Neal, in his opening comments, talked about the concern on our side about a study. We are the Committee of Cognizance in charge of the most important, the number one insurance program for the nation, the number one anti-poverty program for the elderly, the number one anti-poverty program for children, more veterans rely on Social Security disability than they do on the VA. It is our responsibility. I can remember the venerated Sam Johnson talking from his heart about how important, and he brought an extra special veteran's perspective on this. And there will be different paths that people choose to select, whether it's solvency, but for 52 years not to act on a program that is our cognizance. This is marvelous legislation and thoughtful, et cetera, but it does not get to the depth of the problem. The chairman cited 65 million with 10,000 baby boomers a day becoming eligible will be, on, will be beyond 70 million Americans, 5 million of whom yet below poverty level checks from their government who've worked and paid in all their lives. Their government, that's us. That's you and me. That is this committee's responsibility and cognizance. So uh, as Mr. Neal pointed out, the fierce urgency of now is never more apparent. We can do this together. Think about your time in office being able, every one of you has a card. On that card, it shows you how much money comes into your district monthly. This is the best economic development plan we could provide for our districts that directly goes to people who then directly spend it right back in the district that you represent. Uh, I applaud the efforts on this, but it, I would be remiss if I did not bring up the fact that a program that uses less than 1% administrative cost to run itself, instead of being lauded, gets attacked and cut, instead of being pursued so that we can help out our fellow citizens. Those 10,000 baby boomers a day are gonna be very much aware of the needs they have not been provided. And that's why I think this is so vitally important that this committee assume its responsibility and cognizance and associated myself with the remarks of the chair, chairman, excuse me, ranking member Neal, uh, but do thank the chairman for your eloquence at the start of just how critically important social security is to each and every member on this committee. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Larson is recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the sponsors of this very important legislation, including my colleague, Mr. Thompson. I support the legislation considered today, and I hope that we can build on our work in the future to provide additional relief where it's needed specifically as it relates to casualty loss deduction. Uh, tens of thousands of homeowners in my district, Ranking Member Neal's, uh, Joe Courtney's, in the Northeast are dealing with this unique issue that threatens their homes and frankly their finances as well. These homeowners through no fault of their own are dealing with crumbling home foundations. Unbeknownst to them, the concrete used in those foundations contain pyrotite, which we now know crumbles over time and pressure. Now they are dealing with exorbitant bills to replace their foundations. 
Uh, in 2017, we worked with the IRS to confirm that these costs were eligible to use the casualty loss deduction. Unfortunately, despite longstanding policy that allowed any qualified homeowner to use the deduction, it is currently and temporarily limited to damages incurred under a presidentially declared disaster. While this is especially harmful to those impacted by crumbling foundations, this limitation bars individuals from every part of the country from getting needed relief simply because their significant loss occurred outside of a presidential declared disaster. I want to commend again Representatives Crenshaw, Rogers, and Brownlee who have introduced bipartisan legislation around along with Mr. Courtney to restore the full casualty loss deduction and allow every American the opportunity to recover from this disaster. Mr. Chairman, I indulge upon you and thank you again and hope as the committee continues its work on disaster relief, we can work together with you on this bipartisan policy. I, I thank the gentleman for his comments and I certainly understand um, the interest in helping constituents back to get back on their feet. That's what we all want to do and be happy to work, work with you to try to find a path forward. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with that I yield back my time.